bring us to the place where where we're really and and uh, we were talking about, you know, who could we get to come in that could speak to people and and the pastor go, oh, if we could just get Zig Ziglar to come in. Now, anybody know Zig, the name Zig Ziglar? So you made it up. No. Oh, no. Wasn't he a hype for businesses? Yeah, he was this guy, this motivational speaker for businesses that also had a pseudo Christian ambiance about him. And the thing was, he can get everybody all stirred up. Because, hey, all we need is to get people stirred up, and that's revival. The emotions. How easy it is to fall into this same thing. Saul's tall. Man, we can put him out in front, and everybody will be scared of him. Till a guy two foot taller or a foot tall, foot and a half taller than he is shows up, and then all of a sudden he doesn't look so impressive. Oh, God did so. He did. He did. But how did he pick him? No, there was a, there was a, he was said that a man would come to this process. How, how did God pick him? What was the basis? Early on, Saul didn't have much confidence. In you want a king. You're demanding a king. You shouldn't want a king. You shouldn't ask for a king. I don't want you to have a king. We want a king. It's wrong to... It's wrong to ask for a king. We want a king. So God says, can have it. Fine. I'll okay. give you okay. a king. You want a king? You can have it. Why was it wrong to have a king? Because God was supposed to be there. Because God was to be their king. Okay. You, you need to understand, you need to understand, and this is what's going on in America today. You need to understand the difference between the government that Israel had at the time. What was the government that Israel had pre when Samuel and, and when all the others? Early than that, there were the Through judges, the book of Judges. Judges, individuals would lead them for 20 years. Judges and the prophets. They were judges. What was a judge? What was a judge? And we need to understand this because this is what God wanted them to have. What was a judge? I don't think it's the same kind as in like the judge we have. In Wasn't a right. judge in a courtroom. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like maybe it was like a lawmaker kind of thing. What? Well, some of them were prophet, pro, somewhat prophet, but what they were was they were a ruler who only ruled by, I'll give a word, it's probably not accurate, charisma. What authority did they have? Could they execute people? No. Could they demand taxes? No. Could they impress an army? Could they, did they have castles and fortifications and fortified cities and, and personal guards that they could send out to kill somebody that disagreed with them? What could they do? They had one power. They could speak up and say, I'm going out because God sent us rally around me. Samson. Yes. And Deborah, well, Deborah was not supposed to be a judge. She became one. Who was who was the judge? Um, well, Gideon was a judge, but the, uh, there was a guy with with her. Yeah, something like that. It's something with a B. Yeah. Um, he was supposed to be the judge. 
But he wouldn't do it. Unless you come with me, I won't do it. He said, I'll only do it if you get out in front of me. Talk about, you know, hiding. And she said, I'll get credit for it. <laughs> yeah, and she said. So all these people could do is they could rule by authority. They had no, what's that other word? They had no power. And the only way that they could get anything done is if they had the authority that people saw God's authority in their life and were willing to follow them. But guess what? Is that a comfortable way to live? Why? Because you have to live by God was trying from the very beginning, all through the all through the Old Testament, he's trying to show them to live by faith. Does a king need to live, live by faith? No, he rules he is by the power. Authority, so. And Saul wasn't, he's called King Saul, but Saul wasn't a true king. The first true king in Israel is David. And what does David have? What's the big thing that David has even before he becomes king? That's true, but he has he, he has that, but he has something. He possesses something, a something you can point a finger at and, and see, a physical thing. He had his mighty men. What were David's mighty men? That's after he came. No, he had them before. They followed him. Yeah, they were. They followed him. When he was fighting with Saul. And, when he went to and they were all dispossessed men that also had a beef with Saul. And he became lord over them even before he was king. And their commitment was to Israel? No, it was, no, it was, no, it was to David personally. They were his 600 mighty men. What were they? Athenians. They were full-time soldiers. A judge, how many full-time soldiers did a judge have? Zero. If he needed to raise an army, what did he have to do? He had to go to the tribes and say, send me some men. And what would happen? Maybe the tribes would send some men. Maybe they wouldn't. If they did, God's with us. We'll go out and try it. David had a standing army. If there's a problem, what can he do? Now, he's going to need to draw in more, but he's got those 600 men. They're all the officers. He draws in 20,000 people. He's got his 600 officers to oversee them. He's got his champions. And the, who are they loyal to? David. David. You see, David didn't have to live by faith like a judge because he had his 600 men. He also had... Castles, fortifications, fortified cities, because he can raise taxes. And what did God say? If you have a king, what will they do? Scripture. They'll conscript your sons and they'll raise your taxes. No, much later. And what was the purpose of your conservation? So anoint him for that to, to show he is the one that I have chosen at this point. And it this was time Israel still has Saul as, Saul as king. What was the four? I mean, an ungoverned people sounds strange from the Exodus to um, who who were the authority? Who were the day to day rulers in Israel up until David? No. The chiefs of the various tribes. The tribal leaders. So we could very much compare that to our own history. If you understand American history, you could understand Israel's history. What was Israel up until David? The 13 colonies. Yeah, that's going to... If you want to draw the parallel with the United States, they were the 13 colonies. And boy, doesn't that work out because there were 13 of them. 
There were not 12 tribes, there were 13. Because Joseph was the 13. Because Joseph was two tribes, um, because both of his sons got a tribe. He got a double portion. So you had these 13 tribes. Who was the highest legitimate government official in Israel up until somewhat Saul, but even more so David? The chief of those tribes, of each of those tribes. And when you went from tribe to tr tribal area to tribal area, you were going into a different government. They could pass their own laws. They could they had their own rules. It would be it could be dangerous. And you see some of that in the time of the judges where somebody was traveling and bad things happened to them because they were going through another tribal area and the people of that tribe didn't respect them. Especially the tribe of Benjamin. Um, and and so that's where there was all this chaos, is because you had 13 rulers in Israel. And there was no federal government, what we would call a federal government, overseeing the exchange between those. Where did the judge fit into that? Scenario? And the judge became that federal government. But it was a very ad hoc federal government. It wasn't like what we have in the United States today. It was very much like George Washington's federal government. George Washington may have been president. There may have been a Congress. But who's really had the power in America during George Washington's presidency? States. The 13 states. And a governor in a state had way more power than the president had. But what happened over the last 250 years in America? More and more of the power has been Take us. taken over by Washington. And so now Washington is the center of power and things are ruled from this. Well, what happens in Israel? The same thing. More and more power gets centralized into the kingship. And now he's got all these retainers and he has a standing army and he has all of these ministers, all of whom have to be. And that takes a lot of money. And so by the time so uh, Solomon comes along, what happens? The taxes are so high to afford all of these government officials that are working for Solomon. All these building projects. All these wives. All the wives. <laughs> but the wives were, were, the wives were a minor cost compared to all this other stuff. Really? Really. 300 of them? Uh, so, uh, a thousand of them. They said a thousand. Well, a thousand. If you count the other stuff. If you count yeah. the concubines. But even that was not, that that was a household. Yeah, that and that took, but he's got all of these other people who are working for him that are setting up all kinds of laws and regulations that the tribes have to follow now. And the tribes go, hey, we don't like this. And then when his son, Rehoboam, comes along, they say, back off, or we're out of here. And what happens? He said, he said, I told you so. Yeah. He said, you Rehob think my father was rough. I am going to yeah. rule you with scorpions and not you, whips like my father did. You answered Paul's question on... What was it that Saul was supposed to be fulfilling? What? Why was David chosen? He didn't answer that. Well, he was chosen because Saul failed. He had a he had a desire to please God. Yes, um, and hard for God. But even in that, the people couldn't see that, didn't value that. Even Samuel, who's the prophet, what did they value? The appearance. Oh, he looks good. But he didn't know anything about the things. Where do you, where does it say that Samuel was enamored by his verse twelve? Yeah, it says he was handsome. Verse twelve. So he Samuel, going back to verse eleven, sent and had him brought in, and he was ruddy. That's Samuel's perspective. That's Samuel's POV. 
Oh, he looks good. It's not his family. <laughs> his family didn't go, oh, David looks good. He was the 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 the, the little kid. He was the runt of the family. There and, and even later, you know, when he goes to see his brothers, his brothers are, oh, here comes that wonderful looking Daniel. His brothers, what are you doing here? Get back with the sheep where you belong. Is that why you think God went out of his way? He came in human form. He was not of any interest. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you compare who was who was the superhero of the Old Testament? Samson. Samson. And maybe David. And both of them, what what is the descriptor of them? You know, they were great, they're mighty, they're great warriors, they're battle-tested. Who's the superhero of the New Testament? Paul. Paul. Blind as a bat. He attacked other Christians. I had to, I had to translate for um, the top level I took. Five semesters of Greek or something like that, I think. Been a long time. Don't ask me to do it because if you don't use it, you lose it. But for my top level Greek in seminary, we had to translate a passage of Koine Greek into English during a two hour final. We had two hours come in, translate this passage. Well, he couldn't. Pick a passage from the Bible. Why? Because you wouldn't have memorized it. Might be something you've memorized. So you get started and go, oh, that's what and you're done. So he he translated a fragment from a first century letter between Christians that purports to introduce the apostle Paul. And it's it's a letter that was apparently written between two Christians. And if it's a if it was a fake from later, they were at least writing it in that style. Uh, that that describes Paul because Paul was going to a city where he hadn't been, and the church needs to look out for him. And they couldn't have you know in the airports you have the guy standing there with a sign that says you know <laughs> well they they can't be standing Apostle Paul Apostle Paul why not they'd be in the stone. Yeah, because Paul was not the most popular character in the Roman world, and that would be dangerous for him and for the person holding the oh, sign. He'd be holding yeah. a target. So they 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 included in this letter a physical description of him, so the guy could just be sauntering around the gate, which people did. And when he sees somebody that matches that description, can go up and try to introduce himself and see if it's the Apostle Paul. And he's described as being short, bow-legged limping um bald. yeah bald um uh, has has no eyesight so he's going to be squinting at everything um this is not a man that people would have gone yeah let's get him in to preach because he's you know mr charismatic here and we know that from the bible why the scriptures because in Corinthians, what does it say about Paul? Oh, his letters are weighty and powerful. But in person, he ain't nothing special. Right? And in, in Galatians, it talks about, yeah. yeah, having to have someone else write for him. And when he writes Galatians, he says, look at what large letters I've used. He had to use giant print as he's writing because he couldn't see. Galatians is apparently the only letter that he actually wrote himself. He was so desperate to get it out. He also prayed that God would take away whatever was his weakness. Yeah. So you have this same thing that that throughout the Old Testament they are constantly enamored with the by the physical, and and you have a little bit of that in the New Testament because who becomes the spokesman of the apostles? Peter. Well, what's the characteristic of Peter? He's a big, burly fisherman. He's, you know, athletic. 
you have to be to row those boats and haul in those nets. He's 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 the David physique. He's the he's the um, uh, the the Samson physique. But God doesn't use him in the same way that He uses this broken down body, Paul. Yet God does the same thing with Jesus. Yeah. And, and, you know, he was not at all. Uh, I love the description that's given. There's a guy named McGreedy. He was part of the Third Great Awakening in America. He was a preacher in Tennessee. And, and the only description that's given of him was this guy. I think his first name was James. James McGreedy is uh, that he was so ugly that no one had ever seen a person as ugly as he <laughs> was. Um, but but again, that fits. Isn't that what Isaiah 53 is saying about Jesus? Yeah. 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 Yep. There was nothing about him that we would go, wow. So he could literally be like in a building right now and everyone would be looking at the pictures that we have on the walls and go, oh, that's... Who's that guy? Yeah. 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 And again, it comes back. And that's so important because what do we do in the church today? Let's get in Zig Ziglar because he's, he's, you know, this great orator and, and he'll draw a huge crowd. And no, let's get in somebody that will actually preach the word of God to us and confront us with the Holy One of Israel so that we can repent and really get right with God. And then God can start blessing us. No, we need somebody to stir us up. Do you see that same principle at work? We want what looks good and sounds good. Do we know the physical appearance of Jesus? Not other than, well, okay. Not other than Isaiah, except for what? What do we know about the physical appearance of Jesus? Well, the people that lived in that era. Not white, not white. Olive complexion. Yeah. Yeah. That he first of all, he's Jewish. He's a Mediterranean um person of Mediterranean heritage. So what do we know about him just from that? Olive skin. He didn't have long hair. Dark hair, dark brown, black hair. He did a lot of physical work. He he was a, a builder. How did people build in Israel? Stones. With stones. So what do we know about him from that? And he yeah, was probably behind him. quite muscular. Um, so Derek, since you were over there, does that give you a pretty good picture of what he probably looked like? Uh, hit or mix. I looked when we were there in Israel. It was, uh, if I didn't know where I was at, I was thinking I was getting dropped into a random city in uh in the united states uh except when you kind of talk to them then you hear the accent oh, okay. or if you get closer to the wall then yeah you, you see a lot of the greek orthodox okay see, because remember what is israel today israel is is an amalgamation yes there are people who are jewish but those jewish people have come from all over the world yep. yeah um but in Jesus' day, it would have been much more homogeneous because people didn't travel like they do today. Yeah, they don't have jets and cars. And um, <laughs> but other than that, we do not have any. And again, why does God do that? Because what is our tendency? Focus on the, the, the physical. What did uh, who's yeah. who is the greatest person of the Old Testament? Moses. Moses. What does God do about Moses? Well, he's, he's a very humble. Yeah, he, he takes him up on a mountain. And God himself buries him. And the Jude says that Michael came down and took the body anyway. So why does he do that? Oh, so they wouldn't worship the bones? Because Moses would have become 
this idol to Another them, idol. just like. Yeah. What are Asherah poles? We still have Asherah poles today, by the way. Well, started out by God for another reason. Like the, what are what were Asherah poles? What did they actually look like? They were like snakes. They were a serpent wrapped around a pole. Where do we have them today? The medical Meta, The symbol of doctors is is actually an Asherah pole. Now <laughs> it was translated into Greek culture and given a different name, but it it comes out of the Middle East. It comes out of of uh, the, the Canaanite religions. Where did Israel start with the Asherah pole? Remember when they were having the plague? Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say snakes, when, when the snakes were attacking them and they yep. wanted us to lift up the snake to remind them. Put yep. The pole and put, it put it on a pole, put a bronze snake on a pole and 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 they were supposed to simply do that to show the snakes, to, to show them their sin. What did the people begin to do? They turned it into worship. They turned it into an idol and started worshiping it. That, that is the tendency of humanity. They probably would have worshiped the Ark of the Covenant if that was still already. Uh, undoubtedly. Uh, they would have worshiped the Ark. Even. Don't touch it, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's not a big thing like it was, but man, when I got saved 50 years ago, well, but, but 50 years ago, there was this big push, you know, and there were all these people claiming they'd seen the ark and they'd sighted the ark and they were, they wanted to raise money to go and, and raise the ark and keep the ark. And, um, uh, and, and let's be honest, what is the, uh, most probable outcome for the ark. Disintegrated. Yeah, it disintegrated thousands wood. of years ago because it was made out of wood. wood. And that wood was Gopher wood. in the water for a long time. And what happens to wood that's in the water for a long time? It, it just becomes rotten. And then when you take it out of the water, uh, it, it just disintegrate like they found they found the if you ever go to israel and there's a they they found a boat from jesus era in the 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 sea of galilee when i first went there in 1992 they um they had found this boat because there was a huge drought and they didn't have rain for about three years or significant rain for about three years. And the Sea of Galilee went down six feet. Now, if you go down in height six feet, how far out from the shore does that? A long way, like yeah. 40, 50 feet. Uh, and people were, hey, what's down here? And they found a boat. And it dates it is the exact same descriptions as the Gospels give of the boat that Jesus was in from Peter or the other apostles. Um, they found it buried in the mud. And they started to clean it out. And the uh, Israeli antiquities people showed up and said, no, 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 no. You got to build a dam around it and get water in here and fill this back up with water now or that boat is going to disintegrated and then they they built a dam and, and filled this area up with water and they had a pump constantly pumping water in to keep this area wet and then what they did is they dug under it and they just literally uh encased that whole thing including the water and they lifted the whole thing including the water up and put it on a truck and shipped it to this building that they literally built for it um and when they got it there, they sealed it in a sealed room where there was there was no a sterile room. And then they began to pump this plastic stuff, liquid plastic, into the water and allowed that plastic to soak into the wood 
and fill the wood with this plastic stuff to replace the water that was in the wood. And only after they did that, and this wood had literally been plasticized, were they allowed to then drain the water out and clean off the mud, and the boat was preserved. Why didn't the water destroy the boat while it was under in the mud? Because it, 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 it was in that environment and was stable in that environment. Yeah. There's a bridge between Rivers and Built out of wood. It was built in my mom and Jim. It's still the to this day because it stays at the park. Yeah. Yeah. The oxygen, the, there's not enough oxygen there for the uh for the airborne uh things that destroy it to uh, to get to it. It's the same thing like the cedar cedar yep. tests. My grandmother yep. gave every granddaughter a lamb to remind them of the land of God. And when I was, I don't know, I guess like in my 20s, because my mom had to take it out, it started to come apart very quickly. So we ended up putting it back in. Yep. So, but but again, what's the, the constant threat? Well, we'll venerate it. And, and you see this in the church age. Let's go back, let's go back through the church age. What, if, if you were to go back a thousand years in the church age, and we were to get together um, and talk about, oh, we need to, a great spiritual pilgrimage. Where would we be going? Perhaps. Perhaps Rome. Or perhaps some church that was much closer to where we live that had... that had some kind of holy artifact. And what would those holy artifacts be? The things that were in the holy trees. The, the bone from Peter's little finger. Oh. <laughs> or a, 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 a chunk of the wood of the true cross. Or any kind of other thing and and people would go there because if I just get close to that. You mean like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or any of the other Indiana Jones things. <laughs> yeah. The Dead Sea Scrolls, didn't they say they had something like that too? Um, thankfully, they were more into the 20th century. They were found in the 20th century. So it was seen more as archaeology. And and the people that that got a hold of them put them in a museum rather than an artifact place where, but don't we see that today? How, how many times could you turn on the TV today and have somebody send you sanctified water from the Jordan River yeah. that if you baptize yourself with this, you will be blessed healed. or healed or whatever? Those things get very gross after about five years. I just threw them all out. Yeah. <laughs> You didn't boil yours either, huh? You didn't boil. You got to boil. I, I, where were you all at when I needed you? <laughs> um, so that's our tendency as human beings. And, and God is pointing that out to us. And, and remember, what one last verse and then we're done. Turn over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 6. First Corinthians 10, 6. What's that said? Now these things. Go ahead, Paul. That's fine. You can go. Now go these ahead. things occurred as examples to us for from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters or as some of them were, as it is written, these people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes, 
and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Keep going. These things happened to them as examples and we were, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if and, you and so and so he, what's he saying here? First Corinthians 10 uh, 6 to 11. Well, that there are examples that we learned. That everything in that Old Testament was written down to tell us about ourselves, what we are like. Because guess what? All that stuff that they did, we do. We are very much tempted by those same things. That is our inclination as well. And then, of course, you go, jump down to verse 13. Um, no temptation has ever taken you except that is common to you. And that's the context of that verse about no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. You see the same things. So when you look at Samuel and you go, Samuel, how could you be so stupid? Understand that we, that is our tendency. Ooh, let's look at the natural. Let's judge by what we see. That's the old saying, if you don't learn from history, you're doing to repeat it. And so we it, let's go to the evangelical church. Let's jump out of the Catholic church. Go, you know, what's the big temptation now in the evangelical church? It has been for the last 20 years. Because that appeals to us as America. What Americans, what is the, the creed of America? Bigger is better. Brighter is better. Am I wrong? And, and successful is better. And, and so that feeds our natural idolatrous tendencies. But success isn't wrong. It's just depending on what you consider success. And you get there. And what you do with it. Well, and where, where, it's a, more where your heart's at, though, right? It, so, it, like, if, in a sense, it's, it's how you define success. Right. Um, was Jesus successful? He got the apostles. Got to the cross. Yeah. He was successful in what he was striving for. If you take the first six months of Jesus' ministry, or maybe year of his ministry, would we count him as being successful? From our opinion, no. He was enabling. Oh, I'd say very much so. Yeah, yeah. he was enabling he had, the... 40,000 people uh, showing up to hear him speak? Yeah, yeah. People saying, wow, he's doing miracles? Yeah. We should make this man king. And then John, it says they came to make him king by force. We're going to make you be king. Because you're what, just what we need. For the next two years, what does Jesus purposely set out to do that's true but in this context tries to stay under the radar. He's always yeah. somewhat but it's even more than that he deliberately sets out to drive most of the people away and if you look at john 6 what's he start saying in john 6 unless you No worse for them. Uh, unless you eat my flesh drink and my drink blood. my blood, you have no part of me. And what's John 6, 66 say? 666? Six, six, six? No. No? This, that's, that's eight. This time, many of his disciples turned back and they were from this time, many of his disciples, not a handful. Yeah, well, yeah they did. I mean, that's too much. 
And then does Jesus go, wait, 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 wait. I'm losing my success here. I don't have the crowds anymore. Or does he double down? Because then you get to John 8. And what does he do in John 8? Louise? Yeah, you're of your father, the devil. Now, the crowd that the thinned crowd that was still hanging in here, he turns to them and calls them the, of their father, the devil. Guess what happens? They disappear. Boom, more out the door. Jesus wanted deep, not wide. The way we've measured success in America is wide, not, not deep. deep. Big crowd, little commitment. Jesus wanted small crowd or no crowd, deep commitment. Quantity over quality or quality versus quantity. Yeah. But again, if you look in the church in America today, do we value the, the success that Jesus would have called success? And the answer is for, for much of the church. No. No. Well, the funny thing is, even in the secular room, we still go for quantity over quality. If we can yep. put something out that's cheap and we yep. don't have to put a lot of cost in there. Good enough. Yeah. Yeah. So. And again, isn't that exactly the, the kind of stuff that we're feeding off of this natural? That's what feeds our natural inclination. That's what feeds our fleshly desires. And that's what you see in Saul. That's what you see even to an extent in David. Because Samuel, after God told him, don't look at that. He turns right around and that's what he looks at. Yeah, I would have never picked him. Yeah, but but that's him writing it. Yeah, he wrote what yeah. he saw. Mm -hmm. So those things are vitally important because again, it comes back to the mindset. We have Paul. What does Paul say about the goal of the Christian life? We have the mind of Christ. That's more than we've memorized a few verses or we can quote this verse or that verse or we attend this service. That means that we have begun to bend ourselves to think like God thinks, like to have his perspective. And fundamentally, that has to start with, with what we value most. And, and and I know we've been looking at this verse a lot, but it's so endemic to this. Psalm 103, 7. Moses knew God's. Only his, knew his, his ways. Yeah. And his ways are, are why he's doing it, what he values, what his this says about his character. And Israel never got that. At best, they just knew what he did and said, ooh, let's get him to do more of it. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. Hey, God bless. Have Somebody asked a while ago.